Thank you. Y'all remember the, uh, what's his name, Shinzu, the flying violinist? That's actually what I had planned to do. And uh, I want you to imagine my disappointment when they said, oh, that's already been done. So uh, that's probably just as well, though, because see, I only know how to play the drums. I don't know how that would have worked. But I was searching for a, a topic for discussion, and I thought, retirement's pretty good. You know, that's pretty close to flying around out of control a little bit, trying to play a musical instrument or something, you know. So uh, I'll talk to you tonight about retirement. Uh, first, a little bit of uh, history about myself. I was a teenager in the early 60s. Now, uh, that time was, um, there's probably a greater divide between my generation and my father's generation than there was before prior to that and probably even after that. Uh, see, uh, my father's generation had worked as a team and, uh, you know, respected authority and uh, did all the things they were supposed to do. They had uh, won a world war and things. My group came, my generation came along and we uh, didn't trust anybody over 30. Uh, a lot of uh, folks would uh, challenge authority, demonstrate, do things uh, I uh, actually was about to get drafted, so I joined the uh, United States Air Force. So I didn't do a lot of protesting and stuff. Uh, but the folks that did protest, we all kind of had one common thing with our generation, and that was, you know, if we were just in charge, some way things would be different. If only we were in charge, surely things would be different. Well, over time, my generation did get to be in charge, and things remained pretty much the same. Nothing changed much. For those things that we did change, I don't know that they came out better. But anyway, after I uh, got out of the Air Force, I uh, went to college, got a college degree, and uh, joined the workforce. And then suddenly, I got this big dream that I uh, started focusing on, and it was retirement for some reason. I don't know why I started thinking and dreaming about retirement so soon. I think some of it might have been that being in charge wasn't nearly as much fun as I thought it was going to be. But uh, anyway, it wasn't that I had bad jobs. Uh, most of my bosses were pretty good. Most were, most, uh, so, some were better than others, uh, but they were all good. Well, no, wait, there was that one... Actually, that's just a jab. See, any of my old bosses that may be in the audience or they may see the video, uh, they're probably all thinking right now, is he talking about me? <laughs> so uh, anyway, that's one of the fun things about retiring is you can kind of jab at your old bosses and stuff. But um, I uh, uh, did the normal things you do through life. You know, I got married, uh, bought a boat, bought a house, raised some kids, got some grandkids, that whole thing that just kind of happens to you through life, but always out there, there was this retirement dream that I had, and it was kind of on the horizon. You couldn't really make it out. You couldn't really see it very well, but it was there, and it was slowly moving, moving toward me. As time goes by, it got closer. I could see it better. It became to get in, began to get in focus a little bit, and it started moving faster and faster toward me, and all of a sudden, one day, I'm retired. The day before, I had a place to go to work. This day, I couldn't go sit in my office like I used to. I didn't have a reason to get up and get out of bed and go to work. Uh, but I was retired, so I said, let's, let's make the best of this. See, I, had, uh, uh, I struggled a good bit, though, because all my adult life, I had this structure of Monday through Friday, you get up and you go to work. Saturday is a fun day. You do some, something that's entertaining or fun to you or your family or whatever. And then Sunday's uh, church and a nap. Most, da most Sundays, those two things happen separately, but sometimes <laughs> they kind of happen at the same time, you know? But uh, suddenly, every day was the same as the day before. You know, there wasn't any difference. There wasn't that structure that I was used to. Uh, now, Sunday was pretty easy because you could uh, tell it was Sunday when uh, the newspaper's bigger on Sunday than it is on other days. So that was kind of a, a quick thing for Sunday. But the rest of the days of the week, they kind of just kind of all came together and you couldn't tell one from the other. And then suddenly I realized I had this handy tool. It's something that becomes part of your life as you re approach retirement age. 
It's called a pill organizer. <laughs> and it has the day of the week on there. Now, this isn't the model that I use. Actually, the one that I use has whether it's AM or PM on it. So, and I've seen one that actually tells you whether it's afternoon or evening or night. You know, it's just got all kinds of little bins and stuff. Uh, but anyway, the pill organizer can be a, a handy tool not only for organizing your pills, but also to tell you what day of the week it is <laughs> when you retire. So just remember that if you're ever struggling. During this time, uh, my wife told me, she said, uh, I am so excited that you're retired and you can spend more time with me at, around the house. And then uh, I thought, oh, that's just awesome that she would say that. But then she threw in, I just didn't realize it was going to be every day. <laughs> so I thought, well, I got to find a way to get out of the house more. Well, I had done some volunteer work with Habitat for Humanity, and they began calling. See, the Habitat affiliate here was all volunteer uh, at that particular time. So anytime somebody had to do something during the week, they had to take off from work. So they started calling me because they knew I'd retired and uh, asked me to go get permits, go with the inspector to the construction site, different things. So uh, suddenly I had uh, reasons to get out of the house more. But I was still missing that structure, you know, of a place to get up and get ready and go during the week. Uh, but I began, began to kind of be the go-to guy for Habitat. And whenever an inspector would be out there, I'd ask him questions, you know, why does this have to be this way, different things. So uh, I began to get a lot of knowledge uh, and things, and uh, some of the board members at Habitat had applied for a grant, and we got awarded a funding grant to uh, fund an executive director position for three years. Uh, and since I was doing pretty much all the work, they said, we want you to be our first executive director. So suddenly I had a job, not necessarily a job, but I had a, uh, a calling, I think, is more of it. Uh, and I had a reason to get up every morning and get ready and get out of the house, someplace to go. Uh, see, I was getting out of my house to help our low-income partner families get into their house, which is pretty awesome. I don't think I'll ever forget that first day as I was driving off, I had a big smile on my face. I'm getting up, I'm going somewhere, going to, to the Habitat office. And then I looked in my rearview mirror and I could see my wife at the door. And her smile was like twice as big as mine was. <laughs> so I think we were both pretty happy with that situation. Um, over time, the Habitat affiliate uh, uh, really grew, uh, as was mentioned. We got some uh, grant money and uh, built a lot of houses. So far, we've built 49 houses uh, in um, Washita Parish. The, uh, a little bit about the Habitat program. Uh, we use simple house design and volunteer labor to keep the cost of the house low. Then we sell the, cost, the house at cost, and we uh, finance it with a no-interest mortgage. So uh, that allows uh, affordable home ownership, I guess you could say, is our catchphrase. Uh, it allows low-income families to purchase a house. And as Michael had said, that's the American dream, is home ownership. Let's do a, a before and after picture. One of the things that happens in the application process for our partner families is uh, our, our uh, selection committee does a site visit of where the people live, or where the families live, and they document their living conditions. Uh, I won't, don't remember all the specifics about this house, but uh, some of the comments I do remember off of the site visit were uh, it's in a high crime neighborhood. They had uh, furniture uh, placed around the windows to prevent break-ins. Uh, most of these pictures don't do justice, but this is actually a substandard uh, living condition for this house. And as we see in most uh, substandard housing, there was no heat in the house. They used a uh, stove to provide heat in the winter. So what that does is it, it makes for a very cold and drafty uh, house and a bitterly cold house and also extremely high utility bills during the wintertime. Okay, uh, one of the last comments, though, on the, on the visit was that uh, the house was neat and clean. So let's uh, look at an after picture now. 
Uh, I show these pictures all the time in my presentations. And I've got to tell you that most of the time, no, it's all the time. The audience that sees the after picture, they just are all in awe, and they all go, ooh, ah. So we're going to try this again. <laughs> okay, here's the before picture. Now, I want everybody to get ready, because here comes the after picture. Ooh. Uh, uh, <laughs> okay, if that's as good as you can do, that's okay. But uh, anyway, uh, as you can see, the homeowner uh, takes great pride in the house. Uh, they've done a lot of landscaping. Uh, it's a three-bedroom house, and uh, it's up in Sterlington. And uh, if you go inside, the house is uh, neat and clean. Can you imagine the dreams that are being built with this family in this house? Uh, as I mentioned, we built 49 houses all together. We actually have a subdivision over by Carroll High School. We call it Victory Place. Uh, we have 17 houses in there. Now, one of the requirements uh, for our program is that you have to help build your house and other folks' houses. So a lot of people that live in this subdivision have helped build their neighbor's house. Everybody knows everybody's name. It's kind of like Cheers, you know. Uh, and then everybody knows pretty much all the kids that are in the neighborhood. So anytime there's a kid acting up or somebody leaves their bicycle in the road, uh, there's a whole bunch of mamas that know who the kid is and know who the kid's mama is. So uh, they're going to be, uh, 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 I guess, brought to task for their misbehavior in there. But can you imagine all the uh, dreams that are being built in the, in the Victory Place subdivision? Now, every uh, family has a story. Uh, this particular one is a very short one. Uh, one of the uh, families, the first winter in their habitat house, uh, the young girl that lived there, she was in grade school, and I think she had lived in substandard housing all of her life. But uh, she saw me one Saturday when I was in the neighborhood, and she came running out, and she was so excited, she said, I have to go outside to tell if I have to put a coat on to go to school or not. Isn't that awesome? Now, uh, in addition to all of the great things that can occur, uh, there's a lot of social uh, consequence for home ownership. There's been a lot of studies that have been done about it, uh, and uh, I've summarized all those studies into this, this uh, uh, list here. Uh, probably the most far-reaching one, though, is improved child outcomes. I think family stability has a lot to do with that. Now, if somebody is, uh, doesn't own a home, that doesn't mean that their child's not going to be successful. But uh, home ownership creates an environment uh, for success. And it's not just, th these are benefits for everybody owning a home, not just low-income families. But it has a, a special impact on low-income families. One thing that's not listed there is the opportunity for wealth building. Now, uh, that's, a op that's the thing that can break the cycle of poverty if someone's living in poverty, is building wealth. But uh, wealth building is something that we all need to be interested in, especially folks that are thinking about retirement because, you know, your home is one of the bigger investments that you'll ever make. Uh, it shouldn't be your only idea of funding your retirement, but it can be one of the major ones. Um, the uh, uh, other thing that, uh, that happens with uh, home ownership is uh, it's something that it's a legacy that you can leave for future, future generations also. But home owner, the benefits of home ownership are far-reaching, and uh, they're, they're pretty awesome, especially for low-income families. Uh, a, a group of uh, high school friends of mine got together around Christmas time. We all got together, uh, and we were talking to each other about what we're doing and stuff like that. And uh, you could tell the people that had remained active during the time uh, that uh, uh, after they had retired uh, because they were in uh, better health than the folks that had just been sitting around. So uh, don't, uh, when you retire, don't think about just using the pill organizer to tell what day of the week it is. 
you know, uh, do something to get out of the house and uh, get, get away and give your spouse a break a little bit. Uh, do something for yourself. Work on your golf game, go to a cooking school, whatever. But also think about doing something that can reach out and touch someone else. Because when you do those things, those are the real rewarding things that can really uh, wind up touching you too. Improving your golf score, learning how to cook better are, are good things, but touching someone and having that process touch you is the, is the most awesome part. Uh, included in our uh, old-timer get-together, there's always a discussion about things like Social Security and uh, Medicare, medical care in general stuff. Uh, and uh, we always uh, come to the conclusion that things are pretty messed up. And then there's always somebody from my class that throws this in. That said, They say, you know, if we were still in charge... Things might be different. Thank you. <laughs>